Uh, so thanks very much for inviting me, Trevor. It's, it's great to be here. I haven't actually visited uh, St. Mary's before, although I feel guilty. I feel like I should have, but I haven't. So that's great to have the opportunity to come and speak to you uh, this evening. Um, so the topic uh, is, uh, the title of, of this talk is Should There Be Freedom of Dissociation? And I want to begin with some examples uh, of many I could have chosen to illustrate the theme of the talk. So take these examples. Health insurers in California required by the state to provide health cover for abortion even if the employer is a church. Uh, that's a recent case that came up which is now uh, sort of entangled in litigation. Another example, the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario now requires all Ontario doctors to refer requesters of euthanasia if the doctor objects. Another example, a Catholic care home in Belgium fined for refusing euthanasia. And another case which uh, actually Trevor brought to my attention only a few days ago in Sweden of a Swedish midwife who lost uh, in the appeal court uh, after having uh, been sacked from her job for refusing to perform you know, abortions. Um, there's a bit of an outcry about that and that's probably going to go to the European court but at the moment her status is she, she was blackballed by the entire medical community for actually refusing on conscientious grounds to perform abortions. So two of these cases concern Christians and Christian organisations and all of them concern healthcare. So let me give you an example not involving Christians. So consider this. In a recent survey of medical students, 36% of Muslims said they would object to performing an intimate examination of a patient of the opposite sex. The General Medical Council's Education Committee, however, said in 2006 that it would not be possible for a doctor to practice in that environment while refusing to examine, for example, half of all patients on grounds of gender. And here's an example not involving healthcare uh, at all. Uh, in 2007, the University of Delaware was forced by adverse publicity to drop a treatment program in residence halls for the ideological manipulation of students. Students were required to meet with their advisors to answer questions such as the following. When did you discover your sexual identity? Um, what do you think about environmentalism, diversity, racism, and were you in some way privileged or oppressed? One student, unsurprisingly, when asked about their sexuality, replied that it was none of your damn business. And after intense pressure, I mean, it took a lot of pressure through the media and various advocacy organisations, the program was dropped. Um, but it didn't, you know, it didn't go that easily. There had to be a lot of pressure brought to bear for that. And, and there are programs like that all around the states and probably other countries as well. It's just that some of the kinds of example that have really been bothering me for a while now, I could have chosen many others. What these sorts of examples have in common, as far as I can see, is that they involve people being compelled by law or by regulation or by general expectation to act in a way contrary to their sincerely held religious and or ethical beliefs. Healthcare is a lightning rod for this sort of uh, problem, but it can be found across society from solemn legal environments to everyday situations. Uh, and some of you might know about the following. As far as healthcare is concerned, there was a recent consensus statement uh, proclaimed by 15 bioethicists and philosophers uh, in which they insist, among other things, the following. Medical practitioners should normally allow their professional obligations to override their consciences. They must, if they refuse to carry out a particular treatment, refer the patient to someone who will, or if this is impossible, they must do it themselves. Tribunals should be established to assess the sincerity and reasonableness of a practitioner's conscientious objection. The burden should be on the practitioner to prove that their objection is sincere and reasonable. The burden should be on the practitioner, sorry, practitioners who receive an exemption on grounds of conscience should compensate society by doing some other work of public benefit. Students should be trained in performing basic medical procedures, even if they believe them to be morally wrong. And finally, practitioners should be educated about their professional obligations and the possibility of what they call cognitive bias in their conscientious objection. Um, and you can find that on the uh, uh, Oxford Practical Ethics website. So 
clearly there are rumblings of concern within healthcare about the problems caused by people of differing religions and ethical outlooks, uh, working in the same environment and all aiming at providing the same overall kind of service. And the problem is only magnified outside healthcare. Even in a multitude of relatively quotidian ways, whether it be an objection to having to use, for example, a gender neutral bathroom, uh, sunning oneself on the beach next to a Muslim wo woman in a burqa, compulsory sex education in schools, and so on and so forth. The choice of illustration is not relevant to the present discussion even though individual examples are interesting and worth discussing. Nor, to be frank, are the merits of any particular case relevant to present purposes. My focus is on the increasing conflict between significantly different viewpoints in a liberal, pluralistic and largely secular society. The conflict might be between different religious outlooks or between a secular and a religious outlook and involve variations within those overarching perspectives. Now note, just, just to be clear, that by liberal I don't mean something as specific as, for example, classical liberalism to the exclusion of, to the exclusion of social liberalism or vice versa. Although the social liberalism of contemporary society is what will most readily come to mind throughout the present discussion, I don't see as great a difference between it and classical liberalism as others might, might do. Both kinds of liberalism privilege the secular pluralistic state and aim uh, at a kind of harmony between the various groups within that state. Whereas the classical liberal expects the aim to be realized voluntarily, the social liberal is not afraid to enlist the government uh, in enforcing the harmony in diversity. With social liberalism now dominant and given its emphasis on the role of the state, the threat to freedom of religion and conscience clearly comes from that direction rather than from the classical liberalism of, of a million, you know, a follower of, say, John Stuart Mill. At the moment, the way Western societies uh, deal with conflicts between various ethical outlooks, whether religious or secular, is in what seems to me to be a very piecemeal fashion uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. So the courts, mainly in the USA, are loaded with litigation, either challenging some law, requiring a person or group to uh, violate their religious or ethical beliefs, or attempting to overturn a refusal by some person or group to act in this way. Whether it's wearing a cross at one's place of work, wearing a burkini on the beach, or baking a cake for a gay wedding, governments and courts try to handle the situation in a way that does not set an overall precedent for these types of conscientious objection case. Now, I don't think this is a particularly stable solution. And it may be that there is no stable solution, but some solutions might be more stable than others. Moreover, it's not merely a question of stability, but of morality. Can any overarching principle be proposed to justify a general approach to these cases? Well, you can have the principle of compulsion, right? You can con say that conscientious objection should have no recognition, and any person may be compelled by the law to violate their conscience for a good reason. That the what the law deems to be a good reason. And the authors, authors of the consensus statement on conscientious objection that I just uh, read from seem to have a slightly milder form of that position as regards healthcare. Um, the only rider that they add is that uh, the treatment needs to be in the best interests of the patient. But um, you know, by that sort of reasoning, the, the best interests of the patient reasoning, um, uh, what might one say about, for example, this horrendous term apotemnophilia, which some of you may have heard of, which is a person's persistent desire to amputate a healthy limb. Um, if the amputation were to remove that desire and spare the person mental distress, might that be required treatment, even if it violated the consciences of most doctors, religious or not? But that aside, the principle of compulsion leaves the crucial question untouched. What counts as a good reason? A religious person might well sign up to the principle that conscience can be overridden, but they would differ markedly from a secularist about uh, the conditions under which that can be done. Abortion is a classic example. Wearing a burkini on the beach is a relatively newer one. So the principle of compulsion would bring us back to square one, as I see it. Moreover, uh, you know, I would have thought that in a liberal society, compulsion was supposed to be a last resort. Isn't freedom of religion a fundamental right? At the very best, shouldn't it entail that religious people cannot be compelled to act in violation of their deeply held religious beliefs, at, at least those beliefs that are central to their religious outlook? 
Religious freedom has had the occasional notable success recently, but perhaps the most famous being the landmark US Supreme Court case of, of Hobby Lobby, in which a for-profit corporation was actually exempted from providing employee contraceptive cover as part of Obamacare, uh, which involved a mandate for requiring health, employer health insurance plans. Uh, this particular company were, received an exemption, and the ground was that the company owners complained that the mandate violated their sincerely held belief, religious beliefs, and the court did agree with them. In that case, however, the plaintiffs were able to rely on a very strongly worded piece of legislation known as the Religious Freedom Restoration Act of 1993. And yet even that legislation is hedged in many American states by non-discrimination clauses or supplementary statutes containing, for example, LGBT and anti-discrimination uh, anti provisions. It's fair to say, as a matter of fact, that it's religious believers who are very much on the back foot in the current state of things, and increasingly so. I can't think of a single case where in one of the modern liberal democratic secular pluralistic societies, a secular person, that is to say one who's not religious, or who even if privately religious doesn't take religion to be a guide to how they should act publicly, has found themselves under legal pressure to conform to a religious norm. I mean, there aren't any such cases that I know of. By the definition of the kind of societies we're talking about, it's going to be rare. On the other hand, you will find a small minority of cases where secular people have objected in conscience to the legal pressure of secular norms, um, the most well-known being conscientious objection in wartime, right? that's the most famous example. Uh, there's also compulsory sex education in schools, to which even many secular people object. Um, still, if you look at the history of litigation in this area, it nearly always involves religious individuals or organisations objecting to laws that compel them to act against their beliefs. Now, whatever the ultimate objective solution to these problems, I question whether in a society of the kind that I'm concerned with, there can be any solution short of the one that I'm going to consider. A secular compulsion, a general governmental right to override conscience, is incompatible with a liberal society, as liberalism is commonly understood. So is blanket protection for conscience as an inviolable right. A piecemeal approach seems to me unprincipled and to postpone the problem rather than resolving it. But there might be another way, although it would be consistent with the main characteristics of a liberal society, it would not exactly live up to its ideals. But then I'm not sure that its ideals, or perhaps its ambitions, were ever acceptable to large portions of the citizenry of most liberal states. Even for more pragmatic liberals, the solution might fall short of expectations, but it's a question of weighing alternatives, and it may be that if a solution consistent with liberalism is available and has the least cost, it is the one behind which liberals should rally, whether they like it or not. So, I propose then not to start from freedom of religion or freedom of conscience, but from freedom of association. Freedom of association is another one of those rights of always officially recognised in liberal societies. So the UN Declara Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, enshrines it as follows. Everyone has the right to freedom of peaceful assembly and association. No one may be compelled to belong to an association. The European Convention on Human Rights says everyone has the right to freedom of peaceful assembly and freedom of association with others followed by a specific reference to trade unions and listing of many exceptions based on law, national security, public safety, and so on, to the point that maybe, at least in the European Convention, the right doesn't seem particularly contentful. But that aside for now, the wording of such statements does seem, uh, the, the wording of such statements seems narrow. It seems confined explicitly or implicitly to trades unions, political organizations, and other semi-public bodies. But the right surely is not that narrow whatever we think of the way it is worded in conventions and declarations. The right to free association, when I mean, you think about it, the right to free association includes such things uh, as the following, and some of these are also recognised in international treaties. Not all of them, some of them are. The right to found a family and choose your spouse. The right to choose your friends, the right to choose where you live, with whom you socialise, who you let onto your property where you shop, where you enjoy leisure time, your business relationships, your political associations and more. Clearly, freedom of association is a broad right, whatever limitations it may be subject to. Note that freedom to choose where and with whom you do business is reflected in the legal right to freedom of contract. 
but this specific right is founded on the moral right to freedom of association. The same for freedom to choose whom to let on your land, where the right to property presupposes freedom of association. Without freedom of association, uh, or with severe curtailment of the right, totalitarianism seems to me to be a likely consequence. I mean, one of the hallmarks of a totalitarian regime is its coercion of membership in officially approved organizations uh, on only and the expulsion uh, of people from the rest. Another is its virtually total surveillance, which severely constricts a person's choice of friends, associates, and even family. Totalitarianism seems to me to contain denial of freedom of association at its core. So I think we can all agree that freedom of association is a fundamental right, though not without limits. I'm not free to associate with others for a criminal purpose. That's called conspiracy. I'm not free, as the law currently stands, to marry five women at the same time, even if they all freely consent. Associations that break the law are forbidden, and of course the devil is always in the detail. What should those limits be? But I want to focus on the converse of freedom of association, what I call freedom of dissociation. After all, if we're free to associate with whomever we choose, why are we not free to dissociate from whomever we choose? Just as I'm free to choose my friends, so I'm free to drop them. Just as I'm free to join a trade union, a political party, or for that matter a gym, or a dance club, so I'm free to end my membership. Nor am I required to join in the first place. So by dissociation I mean both non-association and withdrawal from association. People are free to marry or remain single. They're also free under law to separate or divorce. Some religions forbid divorce and one may debate the ethics of divorce but that's just not the point. We have already noted that issues arise over where the limitations are to be drawn, which I'm going to say more about. For now, I'm arguing that there is a moral right to freedom of dissociation. I'm noting that the law does reflect this. So now, a very quick aside of the kind typical among philosophers. One might question whether there's a general right to freedom of dissociation, even though there is a general right to freedom of association. Perhaps there are specific rights to dissociate from certain kinds of relationship, but no more. Why well, think that every right has, to use the technical parlance, a contrary? Does the right to educate one's children imply a contrary right not to educate them? Does the right, sorry, the right to keep a promise hardly entails the right to break a promise? Obviously, where a right entails or is entailed by an obligation to act in some way, there won't be a contrary right. But that notwithstanding, most if not all of the rights we find clustered together with freedom of association do seem to have contraries. It's plausible to hold that every right that has the form of a permission, but without a corresponding obligation, has a contrary. Working out what the contrary of a right, uh, a right is can be tricky, but consider, for example, freedom of speech. Um, I have the right to speak, but also a contrary right. Well, what is that contrary right? Uh, the contrary right is either ceasing to speak, which is obviously a right, or not speaking when one can, that is, deliberately remaining silent. Deliberate silence, again, has limitations. You know, for example, is there a right to be silent after witnessing some horrific crime? But it looks pretty general. Isn't the famous right to silence of the common law part of the general right to be silent when one might speak? How about freedom of religion itself? Well, I'm free to belong to a religion, but I'm also free to end my membership, whatever the consequences may be for me personally. I'm also free to be an atheist, deliberately to espouse no religion. Freedom of movement means I have the right to live wherever I want within my country, but I'm also free not to move, even if the opportunity arises to move. And I'm free to settle once I've made my choice. It would be absurd to hold, though, that freedom of speech entails freedom to silence someone else. So that is obviously not a contrary right, since the contrary of speaking is remaining silent, not silencing. The contrary of moving is staying still, not making someone else move, and so on. In other words, the, the contrary rights pertain to a person's not doing what they have a right to do in a way that does not violate the rights of others. And that seems to me to be just rights theory 101. But it is important for what I'm going to argue. There may be rights with no contrary, only a contradictory. 
That is to say, although every purely permissive right to do X entails a right not to do X, it may be that not every right to do X entails, to put it lo loosely, um, a right to, I couldn't think of that, there's no real word for it, but a right to un-X or dis-X or dx, and so on for all the other verbal prefixes apart from non. I'm not sure what rights they may be, which is why I assume for now that there are no what I call Hotel California rights. That is to say, rights that you can exercise but not withdraw from exercising. Even if my assumption were false, though, it seems clear that the rights clustering together with freedom of association all do have contraries, which means the onus should be on my opponent to show why freedom of association is an exception. So, let's accept then that there is a right to freedom of dissociation. What consequences might this have? Well, my central claim is that invoking freedom of dissociation and putting it into practice is probably I even wonder whether probably is too strong, quite possibly, verging on probably, the best way of handling the conscientious objection problem growing ever greater in liberal, pluralistic, multicultural, secular, democratic societies. It might be a way of solving the problem rather than either managing it or overturning liberalism altogether and replacing it with a kind of secular authoritarianism. And I've given this paper a couple of times in the past, people have secular authoritarianism, oh, that's too strong. Well. Now, I think it's a real possibility. I mean, religious authoritarianism doesn't look like much of a goer. Um, secular authoritarianism hardly seems to me to be so strong and so kind of unlikely uh, ever to eventuate. So before outlining what I think dissociationism means in principle and practice, I want to make clear what it's not. So dissociation, okay, so let's get a little bit clear on this. Dissociation is not internal secession or balkanization. That is to say, it does not mean the breaking up of liberal society into distinct, independently governed societies. So, Balkanization uh, can work for a while. Look at the Balkans after the fall of the Soviet Union. It usually is a recipe for instability, though, often leading to war or perpetual unrest. So, dissociation is not like that. Dissociation is not supposed to be some sort of geopolitical strategy applied to one state. It's not about who governs us or about independence, ethnic preservation or the like. Rather, it's about how people and groups interact with each other within a state. Note at once that freedom of dissociation can work at the group or, ind or individual level, unlike balkanization. At the individual level, a person whose deeply held religious or ethical convictions are violated by their having to do X in respect of some other person Y uh, should not be compelled to do X, not merely because of freedom of conscience, but because of freedom of dissociation. Now, this is not playing with words as though the two rights amounted to the same thing. Freedom of dissociation is clearly a lot wider than freedom of conscience. So if I choose not to be friends with you, it's unlikely to be because it would violate my deeply held religious or ethical beliefs. I mean, it could be in some cases, probably not going to be. Our choices about who to do business with or who to choose as a spouse or whether to get married or do any particular bit of business at all are unlikely to be matters of conscience, uh, nor is whether to join the local tennis club. Now, within the scope of freedom of association, there will lie matters of conscience. Not all matters of conscience are matters of association, but many of them do fall within the broader ambit. So my question is, why shouldn't individuals or groups be allowed as a matter of law and policy to dissociate themselves from relations with others when such relations would violate their conscience? And the follow-up question is, if they should be allowed, then as long as the people or groups from whom the former dissociate are still able to obtain what they want, why should they object to such a freedom? one which they too would possess. So let's start with healthcare. So you know, I got thinking about this, this general problem um, because of the healthcare, the conscience problem in healthcare. So if we start with healthcare, where so much of the concern currently exists, now in the UK there's a virtual government monopoly on healthcare, something that seemed, I have to say, you know, a little bit editorialising. Uh, it's always seemed odd to me that there should be a government monopoly on healthcare. I mean, why don't we have a government monopoly on food provision, which we did have for a short time after the war, but, you know, other than emergency situations, why don't we have a national food service? 
um, if we have a national... I mean, food is more important than health, so I've never quite understood it, but anyway, there you go. That's fine. In the UK, abortion has been legal since 1967. If you want to work in healthcare, at least in a clinical setting, and you are opposed to abortion, you're going to have a problem. There's a conscience clause in Section 4 of the Abortion Act that will exempt you from participating in any treatment authorised by the Act. But as the midwives Dugan and Wood found out when they lost their Supreme Court case in 2014, the protection does not extend beyond the abortion procedure itself to related tasks such as supervising staff involved more directly in abortions and providing pre- and post-treatment care to patients seeking abortions. Given the wording of the Act, in my view, the court reached a reasonable decision that what, the plaintiffs, uh, that what the plaintiffs objected to on conscience grounds just was not covered by the exemption in the legislation, just as a matter of law. Suppose, however, that there was a more expansive provision of private health care alongside government provision, sufficient to give conscientious objectors to abortion or some other procedure a realistic choice about whether to expose themselves to activities to which they object. At the same time, those with no objection to the relevant activities would still have a practicable option to work within the government healthcare sector. Abortion, or whatever activity it may be, would remain legal and freely available, but objectors would be free and legally permitted to avoid it altogether. Why, at least in principle, should such an arrangement be objectionable? And that's pretty much the arrangement in the USA, because they have a much bigger private healthcare system, and um, it's not that hard, as I understand it, for uh, a practitioner who, healthcare practitioner who objects to abortion on conscience grounds just not to work in a hospital where that's done. There'd be no need for piecemeal conscience clauses or ad hoc litigation, though of course cases would still need adjudication and a body of common law, uh, a common law precedent, would need to develop. The situation would be in many respects, as I say, similar to the, to, to the USA. And the USA has these, what they call the Federal Church Amendments, which have nothing to do with any church but with the name of the senator who uh, introduced it. The Federal Church Amendments, which give extensive conscience protection to workers in hospitals in receipt of federal funding. So in the USA, you've got both the church amendments in federally funded hospitals, which give conscience objections, and you have an expansive private sector where you can basically shop around and work for the hospital of your choice. Because there's a far more expansive private healthcare sector in the USA than in the UK, then there is already far more employment choice and healthcare workers can generally avoid getting into difficult conscience situations. Now, as a solution to conscience problems in healthcare, more private sector choice would seem very promising. We should, though, look immediately at probably the hardest kind of case. The sort of case that's obviously bizarre, although, in my view, not beyond the realms of possibility. And this is a case that's been brought up to me on more than one occasion by people I've talked to about this, this topic. It's one that may be occurring to some of you already. So take the case of the Satanist nurse who refuses to treat Christians because it goes against her Satanist code of conduct. Should her conscientious objection be respected in law and policy? Well, there are three reasons why she might, a nurse like that might find herself in that situation. One, it was deliberate. Two, it was an accident. Or three, it was necessary. Well, if it was deliberate, that is to say, if the nurse wanted to be in a situation where she could refuse to administer life-saving treatment to a Christian, she would be no different to the diabolical serial killer nurses we occasionally hear about. In other words, she'd be liable to prosecution for homicide. So I'm not suggesting the current laws regarding crimes against the person should be changed to accommodate conscientious objections to not killing. On the other hand, if the Satanist nurse were there by accident, she obviously didn't know what she might be exposed to, so she lacked information. The remedy would be for every hospital to make it abundantly clear what kinds of treatment they provided and whether their patient base was universal or restricted. The third reason she might be there is that the nurse had nowhere else to go to work. And knowing the problem she might have of having to treat a Christian, she held her nose and went to work there anyway. Well, the solution is obvious. She shouldn't have to work there. So on my proposal, she should not have to find another profession any more than Dugan and Wood, the, the, the midwives, uh, had, should have to find another profession. Rather, the Satanist nurse would have the option of working in a private Satanist hospital, where the Satanist code of conduct would be a precondition of employment, and the hospital advertised quite clearly and unambiguously who they treated and what services they offered. Now, 
Needless to say, the hospital should not expect a large clientele. In fact, many hard-headed Satanists would probably avoid such a hospital as well. But at least the nurse would have somewhere to ply her satanic trade. But I said that, I mean, and this sounds flippant, but it, it's not. I mean, you could pick a more realistic, perhaps, case, but I'm trying to pick the most extreme case I can think of to make the point. But I've said that dissociation, dissociationism should apply to individuals as well as groups. So what if the nurse was, as it were, the only Satanist in the village? That freedom of dissociation applies to individuals as well as groups does not imply that an individual can manage without a group to back them up. Conscientious objectors in wartime generally benefit from well worked out procedures enabling them to avoid violating their consciences, whether they be moved to medical work, administrative jobs and so on. An individual pacifist may well feel himself alone, but he knows that there will be others scattered about and many that have gone before him and he can benefit from that shared history. By contrast, if there really were only one Satanist healthcare worker with no Satanist support to rely on, it would, alas, in my view, be bad luck. If the person in that society is so idi idiosyncratic in their beliefs as to find themselves out on a limb, they might just have to make some sacrifices, so to speak. They might well have to retrain or else leave the country. A small price to pay, I should think, for a blanket right to dissociation. Now, that's obviously an outlier case. As I say, not beyond the realms of possibility, but it's an outlier case. In discussing this sort of case, I'm not trying to, to be facetious or dismissive. On the contrary, if such an outlier case can be handled, more realistic and less bizarre cases probably can as well. So, in 2013, as probably all of you will know, or at least most of you will know, in 2013, the UK Supreme Court dismissed a final appeal by Mr. and Mrs. Bull, owners of a guest house in Cornwall, against Mr. Preddy and Mr. Hall, a gay couple who had sought to rent a double room from the owners. They were refused a room because the owners, as Christians, disapproved of homosexuality. In fact, of all extramarital sexual relations. Preddy and Hall claimed discrimination under the Equality Act, Regulation of 2007, and they were successful. Once again, given the law as it stands, it's hard to see how a different decision uh, could have been reached. Um, I'm not as sure about that as I once was reading the, um, the case of the, uh, the, the bakers of the wedding cake for the gay couple, which I, I may come on to. I'm not, not as sure, legally speaking, as I was that the case was decided reasonably, but anyway. As Lady Hale, writing for the court, put it, quote, <coughs> Uh, now that, at long last, same-sex couples can enter into a mutual commitment, which is the equivalent of marriage, this is before uh, gay marriage was, was legalised, the suppliers of goods, facilities and services should treat them in the same way. Now, it seems to me that this sort of case raises very serious, wide-ranging problems of what might be called a structural nature, having nothing in particular to do with gay rights or Christians. The UK Supreme Court ruled that a Christian who objects to homosexuality must rent their guest house room, their guest house room to a gay couple. Renting means selling a time-limited portion of one's property. In the case of a guest house, it also means selling whatever services come with rental of a room, such as making meals, cleaning the room, providing various amenities, and so on. So if the law requires a person to sell their goods and services to another person, even though they object on conscientious grounds to doing so, why shouldn't the law also require a person to work for another person, even though they object on conscientious grounds to working for that person? After all, working for someone is just another contract of sale, the sale of one's labour. Moreover, if the law as it does requires a person to hire another, even though they object on conscientious grounds to doing so, why shouldn't it require someone to work for another despite conscientious objection? In other words, if you are compelled to sell your goods and services to someone despite conscientious objection, why not your labour? And if you are compelled to buy someone's labour despite such an objection, why shouldn't you be compelled to sell it? Yet being compelled by law to work for someone you don't want to work for is tantamount to a form of slavery, or at least forced labour. And for what it's worth, forced labour has long been condemned by the International Labour Organisation in conventions dating back at least 70 years. 
In fact, uh, the, uh, 19, the first convention, the 1930 convention, which has been ratified by 178 countries, condemns the following, quote, all work or service which is exacted from any person under the menace of any penalty and for which the said person has not offered himself voluntarily. The only exceptions are, are military uh, service, normal civic obligations, including minor communal service, um, punishment for conviction in a court and emergency service under uh, sorry, and various kinds of emergency service. Under normal civic obligations, one might include such paid or unpaid labour as jury service um, and assisting law enforcement, among others. Uh, there's no suggestion that it includes routine employment. The 1957 Convention, ratified by 175 countries, explicitly condemns, quote, forced or compulsory labour as a means of political coercion or education or as a punishment for holding or expressing political views or views ideologically opposed to the established political, social or economic system and as a means of racial, social, national or religious discrimination. On the face of it, it seems that being compelled to sell one's labour to a specific person or group despite a conscientious objection to doing so, is ruled out under those conventions. Yet if one must sell one's goods and services, as in the Guesthouse case, what is the difference? If freedom of dissociation were given the force that it deserves, many of these sorts of problems could be obviated. So a Christian couple, for example, could refuse to rent their room to a gay couple as long as there were other providers willing to supply a room. Why should it matter that there be other providers? In other words, why should freedom of dissociation depend upon whether one of the parties can have their wants fulfilled by a third party? Well, the answer is that I'm trying to find a practicable solution to the problem that respects both sides. So, for example, suppose Bill and Bob are starving and they come across one life-saving piece of food that, if divided between them, would not be enough to save either of them. Who should get the food, assuming that there are no other factors to differentiate them in terms of entitlement? It looks as though, in a case such as this, morality has no answer to who should get the food. But it does, in my view. Morality does have an answer, and the answer is, toss a coin. After all, to say that neither Bill nor Bob should have the food, and so both should die, seems morally repugnant. To say that both should have the food is morally impossible, because it's physically impossible. To say that one should be preferred over the other, given no differentiating factor, seems objectionably arbitrary because it's ungrounded in any good reason. So a coin, to a co a coin toss, or the equivalent, looks like the only decent alternative. If Bob wins the toss, then his getting the food is not objectionably arbitrary. Because this is because the coin toss is a way of recognising rather than denying the equal entitlement of both individuals. Random selection is precisely the reason for awarding the food to one rather than the other. Return now to the case at hand. Suppose we were in the unlikely situation where the gay couple could not find another guest house that was sufficiently suitable to meet their needs. Now, in the particular uh, Preddy and Hall case, they found a guest, another guest house you know, within hours. I mean, it was not a problem. Um, Suppose they couldn't find another guest house to meet their needs and there was no other compromise they could reasonably be asked to make, such as abiding by the rules of the Christian guest house or not taking a holiday in that area or that time and so on. In that case, given the assumption that both sides had an equal entitlement to have their rights respected, and that's an assumption I've been making all along, then a coin, a coin toss looks like the only solution. You know, heads you get the room, tails you don't. So if the Christian owners win, the gay couple doesn't get the room. If the gay couple wins, they do. We cannot say that freedom of dissociation should prevail because that would make one side a winner and the other a loser despite their equal entitlement. Hence the requirement that the gay couple, hence the requirement that the gay couple should have a reasonable prospect of meeting their requirements in another way. Of course, what counts as a reasonable prospect is going to be difficult to unpack. So minor inconveniences uh, or minor inconvenience does not make a prospect unreasonable. Having to, you know, having to go one mile down the road, for example, to get another room is not unreasonable. Having to make a total change of plan uh, does make a prospect unreasonable. You know, 
Again, perhaps the devil is in the detail, but here I tend to think that the details should not detain us at this stage. My main point is that if dissociationism is to be a viable policy, all parties have to have a reasonable prospect of respect for their rights. In a conscience case, the objector must have a reasonable prospect of their conscientious objection being respected, and the opposing party must have a similar prospect of their rights being respected. So now consider a particularly difficult case. Take the owner of a guest house who refuses to rent a room to someone because of their ethnicity, or their religion, or their gender. Should freedom of dissociation have any sway here at all? Many of us would think not, just as many would object to dissociation in the Christian guest house uh, case, a gay couple case. In the latter case, however, dissociation does not seem repugnant on its face. In contemporary liberal society, in fact, dissociation might lead to a thriving market in guest houses for gay couples, perhaps only gay or perhaps mixed, and perhaps also in guest houses for Christians. There's no reason in advance for thinking that either group would not be catered for to a good standard. Yet when it comes to ethnicity, religion or gender, and perhaps other groupings, we tend to think immediately that old prejudices will raise their head and one group or another will end up with a short end of the straw. We think of certain, uh, we think of certain groups being treated as second-class citizens with access only to second-tier facilities. This is not inevitable, mind you, uh, something, you know, fun fact that you might not know. Um, it's still legal in the UK to have male-only clubs, right? do not admit females. But there has been a surge as a result in female-only clubs in classy parts of London. It's still legal, legal in the UK to refuse membership to a club or association on grounds of, among other characteristics, religion or ethnic origin as long as the club is set up precisely for the purpose of restriction to the characteristic on the basis of which refusal of membership is made. So it's not as though it is inexorable that lower grade facilities would be all that became available to persons or groups refuse admission to decent facilities. And even if this was the result, why couldn't the government step in and mandate certain standards for all associations? They already do it for food retail, doctor surgeries and so on. Now, despite these reassurances, perhaps I haven't yet met the heart of the worry. Maybe it's not about second-class standards, but it's about the kind of society that we want to live in, about our attitudes towards each other. If there were wholesale limitations on association available to any and every group and even every individual, what would this say about our common citizenry? and about the inclusiveness that is supposed to be the hallmark of a liberal, diverse, secular, tolerant, pluralistic society. Now I can see the worry, but I also see how the issue of tolerance and respect cuts both ways. On one hand, we show tolerance and respect by encouraging association among fellow citizens rather than discouraging association. The governments of pluralistic societies, as well as many liberal-minded citizens, want people to be happy together, not apart. The desire is hardly unreasonable, and it would certainly be illiberal to encourage dissociation among people who don't want it. In other words, it's not as though dissociationism should trump free association, rather it is merely the converse of an existing right. And if the former is downgraded, the latter ceases to be a mere right and becomes something like uh, an obligation. And that looks like a recipe for friction rather than a social lubricant. On the other hand, an essential element of tolerance and respect is the recognition that we all have certain freedoms in the way that we organise our space of social interactions. A person or group might not wish to form a certain association because of a deep and sincerely held objection to involvement in an organisation that requires performance of certain actions violating their religious or ethical beliefs. Or at the other end of the spectrum, they might simply not want to form a certain association due to personal or group preference. People do this sort of thing all the time. For example, in the choice of where they live, where they work, or where they send their children to school. Now, a given preference may or may not mask an attitude worthy of deprecation. 
I might, w I might not want to be your friend, or less strongly, I might not seek your friendship because, for example, I haven't noticed you, or I have enough friends already. Such situations hardly involve reprehensible attitudes. It might also be that I suspect that you are not loyal, or that you are untrustworthy, or just plain boring. Here, attitudes are in play, but they may be perfectly reasonable and they may be founded on good evidence. They may also involve honest beliefs, founded on insufficient evidence, yet without any sort of cognitive irresponsibility on my part. But now suppose I don't like the colour of your hair, or I don't want to be seen with you because I find you ugly, or I just don't like the colour of your skin. Probably all of us would see such attitudes as worthy of deprecation, worthy of disapproval. And yet, no law forces us to make friends with anyone, however bad our reasons for not doing so. It is hard, more importantly, undesirable to legislate against bad attitudes per se, and downright totalitarian to compel particular friendships, whatever the reasons people have for not forming them. So, you know, the law doesn't punish bad, bad attitudes. And I think it would be a step in a totalitarian direction if the law started doing that. But that's something we can, maybe we can talk about in, in discussion. Now, it's not clear to me why civic friendship, if I can put it that way, is especially different in this regard. We all have civic duties, of course, both to the state and to each other. And these require a certain amount of association. I have to associate with Her Majesty's revenue and customs to the extent necessary for me to pay my taxes, not an association I particularly relish. Absolutist tax protesters aside, we rightly find this sort of compelled association desirable. Whenever someone takes on a certain social role or enters into certain communal activities having understood and tacitly accepted the rules surrounding those activities, they are, to a degree, compelled to associate with particular persons and groups rather than others. If you choose to shop in Sainsbury's, you'd better accept the need to associate minimally with the other shoppers. If you choose to send your child to school X rather than school Y, you had better be ready to associate, perhaps to a relatively high degree, with the other parents as well as the teachers. Now this idea of tacit acceptance is important, and it clearly undergirds many of our social interactions. The critic of dissociationism might object that civic friendship is disanalogous to personal friendship precisely due to this tacit acceptance of certain rules and conventions. One does not have to be a sort of a social contract theorist about morality to recognise that there is a sense in which we have all signed up, in scare quotes, to certain kinds of behaviour merely by dint of being a citizen of a certain state, whether or not we, choose, we chose to be one. For the purposes of the present discussion, what we signed up to, what, for the purposes of the present discussion, I ask the question, what have we signed up to in virtue merely of being citizens rather than citizens who have adopted certain roles or social environments? We have signed up to kinds of association necessary for the fulfilment of our civic duties, whether it be paying taxes, being good neighbours, obeying the law, keeping the peace, and so on. If we are capable of working and have no prior duty not to work, we have signed up to being productive members of society, I would have thought, if we, and we can do it. We have not, I contend, signed up to associating with any particular individual or group, though we have signed up to being, as it were, good, good, to being, as it were, good associates of uh, both those with whom association is unavoidable in the circumstances and of whomever we have chosen to associate with in the first place. Other than that, I contend, we are, to put it in a slightly negative form, free to be left alone. I'm not averse to calling the freedom of dissociation the right to be left alone, because this formulation wears on its face the notion of personal space, the freedom without which a person truly is a cog in a totalitarian regime. Personal space is not undermined by the simple fact that when you do associate with others, uh, with other citizens, whether through choice or necessity, you are obliged to be civil to them, in the literal etymological sense of the term. Only anarchists or sociopaths 
think that one's very presence in a state living with its citizenry is an affront to one's personal space. That space is undermined, in my view, by state-sanctioned requirements of particular association. Such requirements shrink one's personal space almost to vanishing point if applied across the board. If not applied across the board, yet still applied broadly in a way that rubs increasingly against one's deeply held beliefs or even against one's simple personal and day-to-day -day choices, as is the case now, one's personal space is severely constrained and diminished. But it could be objected that I'm still missing the point. Because isn't it just for the good of society that the state can compel certain kinds of association from which people might otherwise resile? Well, that raises the question of exactly what the good of society consists in. Isn't that part of what the disagreement is all about? In particular, whether it is for the good of society that there be a legally recognised right to dissociation, one that has both passive and active components where the passive component is the right to be left alone, ab initio, and the active component is the right to withdraw from associations imposed upon a person or group that do not come under the umbrella of general civic duties and similar ones mentioned earlier. Now, if the good of society is just what is being contested, then appeal to it by either side has no weight. So to put the point more clearly, consider an illustration. It's slightly detailed here, so it's not crucial that you follow all of this, but I'll, I'll go through it anyway. Take, for example, 16th century Florence or 17th century England. Consider the state-imposed compulsory contribution for maintenance of the church, for example, the Catholic Church in Florence or the Church of England. More specifically, consider the obligation of a person residing within a certain parish to contribute to the building of a new parish church. There are four relevant situations to consider. First, the citizen might accept that there is a higher obligation overriding their personal choice about whether to contribute, namely the transcendent good of the church. And they suppose there does exist such a good as an objective fact. Second, the citizen does not accept that there is a higher obligation, but in fact there is a, a, a transcendent good grounding such an obligation. Thirdly, the citizen accepts that there is a higher obligation, but there is no such transcendent good. Fourthly, the citizen does not accept a higher obligation and there is no such transcendent good. Now, in case one, the citizen accepts there is a higher obligation overriding their personal preferences uh, and there does exist such a good, such an, an obligation based on, on a real objective good, the citizen has no right to decline to pay, nor would they even consider not paying. In case two, the citizen does not accept that there is a higher obligation, but there is in fact such an obligation. They have no right to decline to pay, so if they did decline due to non-recognition of a higher good, the most they could be afforded by the state would be a degree of tolerance in the strict sense. That is, for the greater peace and stability of society, the state might tolerate their non-payment or a derisory payment. In case three, the citizen accepts a higher obligation, but there is no such transcendent good. Right, we're assuming there that there's no higher good. The society, be it Florence or England, is founded on a big mistake. Yet the citizen, the citizen frankly, accepts a higher obligation, however ill-founded. In other words, they have signed up to certain civic duties recognised in that society. Objectively, they might be under no unqualified obligation to help pay for a new church, nor may any other citizen. However, to put it glibly, they have to play by the rules. Less glibly, the citizen is under an objective but qualified obligation to abide by the conventions of that society, if for no other reason than the sake of peace and stability. So what about case four? where the citizen does not accept any requirement to pay and there is no higher good justifying the supposed obligation. Here, it is hard to see how anything could override a right by the citizen to dissociate from the relationships requiring payment. There might be grounds involving peace and, stabi uh, peace and stability, but only if the objecting citizen were to suffer some sort, uh, the objective citizen, objecting citizens were to suffer some sort of marginalisation or ghettoisation that den denied them fair and equal access to the civic amenities they wish to enjoy. That is precisely why fair and equal access, practically speaking, is so important. 
What about from the other side, the difficulty the church might find itself in of not benefiting from contributions that are being withheld? Well, that too might cause instability among the citizens who fully accept an obligation to pay. Yet I do not see how that sort of risk in any way morally obliges the objectors. If you give me some spurious reason why you need my property, and I know the reason is baseless, the friction caused by your not getting your way hardly obliges me to cough up. So in cases one to three, the first three cases I mentioned, there's no clear right to dissociation, or at least in case three, not one that any citizen would seek to exercise. But I submit that our current predicament is akin to case four. Objectors to certain forms of association, in particular conscientious objectors, do not recognise an obligation to associate in those ways that they object to. The slight but interesting difference from four is that with respect to four, I suggested the state might be labouring under an illusion about whether a transcendent good underwrites the obligations they seek to impose on recalcitrant citizens. Perhaps the religion to which the rulers appeal is a mistake, for example. In our case, however, in the case of liberal society, it's not that liberalism might be wrong, which is a whole other, that's a whole other discussion about the merits or otherwise of liberalism. It's not that liberalism might be wrong, but that liberalism itself offers no higher good to underwrite the obligations of association it seeks to impose. In other words, what exactly is it that liberalism can appeal to that, if it existed, would underwrite a wholly general obligation to associate in ways the state deemed desirable? Is it, for example, progress? But appeal to progress is either vacuous or question begging in this context. What progress could it be other than the progress that involves citizens associating in the way the state wants? The same applies to a term such as harmony. What about getting along? Again, the risk of begging the question is front and centre. There are various ways of getting along, and one of them might be by not getting along. That is to say, going one separate way to a large extent. The same goes for peace. The peace of separation can be as effective as the peace of togetherness. togetherness. And sometimes the peace of togetherness is as illusory as the peace of um, separation is enticing. By peace, one might mean peace and stability, the absence of conflict. In that sense, there might, of course, be an overriding reason to prevent dissociation. But that, to repeat, is precisely why fair and equal access is essential to preventing the sorts of conflict that an appeal to peace and stability is designed to avert. So just to briefly conclude now, um, what does all of this fairly abstract theorising have to do with practical politics? How would a society look if freedom of dissociation were given the respect it deserved? What would a dissociationist society look like in practice? The practical aspect of dissociationism, apart from my rather abstract recommendation concerning fair and equal access and the like, are not my concern. Indeed, as a philosopher, I don't think I'm equipped to say anything of great substance. That is why we have politicians. What I would insist is that a dissociationist society that was recognisably liberal can exist. By definition, it would be secular and pluralistic, with a government and a state apparatus that had to be professedly neutral in its dealings with different individuals and groups. There would, of course, be fierce competition for resources, but then that exists already with various groups and organisations that constantly lobby and even hijack government in order to benefit from taxpayer funds. There seems to be, to me, to be no reason in principle why a system of revenue sharing and equitable distribution could not be implemented. A dissociationist state would, I presume, be highly federalised. Now recall, as I said, I'm not talking about balkanisation or anything else. The issue is not one of borders and sovereignty, but of internal freedoms for individuals and groups. The degree of federalisation would depend on the extent of dissociation, not something anyone can predict in advance. But there would have to be mechanisms for recognising dissociation in various walks of life. So take the, the sort of example that I started with and that's provoked my kind of thinking about these, these areas, namely healthcare. A single monolithic state-run service might not be inherently inconsistent with dissociationism, but the complexity of implementing it might mean that a fully or partly privatised service was the only practical solution.
one could not rule out a fully state-run service broken into multiple subsidiaries that service different groups with equitable sharing of resources, but again, the cost and complexity might be prohibitive compared with the efficiencies of a private system of healthcare. Again, it would depend in large degree on the extent of dissociation. What do people want? What would best service the requirements of the different individuals and groups in a given society? Well, I leave it to experts to think about the ways in which freedom of dissociation could be implemented. What I want to emphasize is that for all the distaste or aversion many might feel towards the dissociationist proposal, the key idea remains. Either there is freedom of association or there is not. If there is, then there must be freedom of dissociation. Either freedom of conscience and freedom of religion are taken seriously or they are not. If there is no freedom of religion or no freedom of conscience or no freedom of dissociation as a broad general right, then liberalism itself seems to me to be a myth. To call oneself liberal while resiling from the rights and freedoms liberals should take seriously is to be a liberal in name only. Rather than focusing on our worst instincts and the many ways in which dissociationism can go wrong, perhaps liberals should do what they've always professed to do, which is to show some faith in human nature and in the possibility for people to get along despite their differences if the social arrangements are right. If, they are, if they're not right, if diversity combined with proximity leads to conflict, then maybe the best way out is just to dissociate. Thank you very much.